Let's now consider an infinite slab of current and see how we can apply Ampere's law to derive the magnetic field that it creates everywhere. So here's our infinite slab. It extends infinitely to the left and to the right, and into the page and out of the page, essentially infinitely in the horizontal plane. It has a thickness b and carries a current density j, which is current per unit area, that comes out of the page toward us. And we want to find the magnetic field created everywhere. Now here's where we have to be careful. Everywhere meaning inside the slab, which is region 1, and outside of the slab, which is region 2. Very similar to what we did with Gauss's law. So we'll start inside and then we'll move to the outside of the slab and we'll do it in two steps to find the magnetic field in each region. The question of course is, how do we apply Ampere's law? In other words, what contour do we choose, a circle or a rectangle? Now that depends on the shape of the magnetic field line. So let's try to figure out what the magnetic field lines look like. Let's take one little piece of current. Think of this maybe as an infinite wire of current coming out of the page. Put your thumb along the current, wrap your fingers of your right hand around your thumb. You'll find that the magnetic field created by this little piece of current here encircles the current and is directed counterclockwise by the right hand rail. Now, of course, that's not the whole slab. It's a part of the slab. But if you think of the slab, as a collection of infinite wires coming out of the page. Then you can repeat this analysis with another piece of current here. Well, in fact, anywhere, but let's just do it for these four just to see what we get. And what you end up finding is that all these little contributions of current, when you superpose them above the slab, in fact, even above the center line, you get a magnetic field that is horizontal and points to the left here. Same reasoning below. I will just draw one of these to get an idea. Here, you would get the same kind of field line. If you do that for all of these, like we did above, you find that the magnetic field by superposition is horizontal, points to the right, below the slab. And the magnetic field is actually in the same direction within the slab for the lower half. In other words, here we still have B for the same reasons pointing to the right, and here we still have B pointing to the left within the slab. And so given the shape of the magnetic field lines, we are going to choose a rectangle as our Empyrean contour. And we'll see why that's a really good contour to choose. Let's start inside the slab and therefore draw our rectangle within the slab. We are going to center it on the x-axis. So let's draw it like this, centered on the x-axis, has a height z, same length here. Of course, that's minus z if we go downward, but the point is it has a height 2z in total. Now let's give it a length l. And then because the magnetic field lines are in the following direction, in other words, point to the left above the center and to the right below the center, let's orient this contour so that we follow the field line. So we'll make DL, or delta L rather, go in this direction, and we'll go around our Amperian rectangle counterclockwise. And that's convenient because meaning on the top and the bottom, delta L is along B. The angle theta between delta L and B is zero. But even better, the angle between delta L and B is 90 on the vertical sides. And that means that B dot delta L is going to be zero. That knocks out the contribution of the vertical sides, which you have to worry about the top and the bottom. So let's write this out. We are trying to figure out the circulation of B that is the sum of B dot delta L around our closed Amperian contour. Now there's four sides, so we're going to take them one at a time. Maybe we even give them numbers to keep track, so call the corners 1, 2, 3, 4. This is going to be the sum from 1 to 2 of B dot delta L. Well, actually, not even the sum. I mean, the sum is the whole thing. So we're going to take B 
times delta L from 1 to 2, that makes more sense, plus B times delta L from 2 to 3, plus B dot delta L from 3 to 4, plus B dot delta L from 4 to 1. And if we expand this, then we're going to get B. The length from 1 to 2 is L. Cosine of the angle between B and delta L is 0. Here it's B times, well, the height is 2Z, but it doesn't matter because cosine of 90 is 0. And 90 is the angle between B and delta L from 2 to 3. Plus B L cosine of 0 from 3 to 4. And then plus B times 2z cosine of 90, which is 0 from 4 to 1. We end up with 2bl. That's the circulation of b around our Empyrean contour. Now we have to evaluate the amount of current that's encircled. It's actually pretty straightforward because j is current per unit area, and because we assume j is constant, all we have to do is multiply j by the encircled area, which is this area here. And that's easy to get because it's a rectangle with length L and height 2z. And so if we take j and we multiply by L times 2z, we get the encircled current. So let's write that mu naught i encircled is equal to mu naught j times L times 2z. And these two quantities by Ampere's law are equal to each other. So let's write that by Ampere's law. Two, call it B1, L is equal to mu naught j L times 2z. Well, the 2s go away, and the L also cancels on either side. But that makes sense. We have an infinite slab along x. We shouldn't have L in our answer. And so B1 is equal to mu naught jz. And we'll just write it in magnitude for now. We'll include direction a little later when we graph the magnetic field inside and outside of the slab. A bit trickier because the direction changes whether you're above the center of the slab or below. But all in all, this is the magnitude of the magnetic field. It's directly proportional to the height above the center line. So we've done region one. Let's do region two. However, before we do region two, let's do the following. This is going to make sense in a second. I'm going to copy this. Because when we do the calculation, the sum of the B dot delta L, math does not care whether we're in region 1 or region 2. It actually doesn't even know. All it knows is that we're going around a rectangle. And in region 2, we're going to go around a rectangle the same way we did in region 1. So we're going to get the same circulation, 2BL. What's going to be different is the amount of current that we encircle. But let's draw this to convince ourselves. Let's take our rectangle, there we go, and let's make it big enough that it lives in region 2. And of course, we're going to give it the same orientation as previously. So this is going to be delta L for each little side. And then we have the magnetic field pointing to the left here and to the right here. That's why we orient our contour counterclockwise. And we follow B on the top and bottom sides. On the vertical sides, again, B is going to be perpendicular to delta L, which is convenient because it's going to knock out a term from the circulation calculation. So now we can just paste this thing because, again, there is no reason why this math should come out any different. As far as the math is concerned, 
You're just following B along a rectangle just like you did before. And the rectangle, by the way, still has a length L and still has a height 2Z. So follow this Z. This, of course, would be minus Z if you account for sine, but in magnitude, you get a height of 2Z. All right. So that's our circulation. What about the amount of current in the circle? Well, here we have to be a little careful. We are going to multiply J by area, however, not by the area in circle. The reason being, there is no current here. There is no current here. So we shouldn't account for that area because then we would overestimate the amount of current that we have. The current is in fact confined to the slab. Therefore, the region that we care about, rather the area that we care about is this area here, that of a rectangle of width L and height B, therefore of area L times B. So mu naught I in circle is equal to mu naught times J times L times little b. All right, and by Ampere's law, these two quantities are equal to each other. By Ampere's law, we have 2, call it B sub 2, because it's B in region 2, L, and is equal to mu naught J L little b. L cancels, as expected, because again, it's an infinite slab along X. We should not have L as part of our answer. And we get B2 in magnitude is mu naught J B little b divided by 2, which, by the way, is independent of the height z above the center line. You get a uniform magnetic field, and it doesn't matter how far you are from the slab. Now, does that make sense in practice? No. But an infinite slab in practice does not make sense either. So, if your premise does not make sense, well, your conclusion will not make sense. But the point is, if you have a distribution that can reasonably be described like an infinite slab of current, then you know that as long as you're not too far above the slab in practice, you will get a uniform magnetic field. So that's useful. All right. We found B1, we found B2. In other words, we found B everywhere. Let's graph B against C and be a little careful because it requires a little bit of care here and clarity in terms of what we're graphing in terms of what. So if we graph B in terms of Z or against Z, first of all, we have to indicate where the slab begins and ends. So minus B over 2 and B over 2. Within that interval, we're inside the slab. Outside of that interval, we're outside of the slab. All right. And just as a reminder, this is the slab, by the way, for clarity. Right, so it's an infinite slab. We know that above the center line, B points to the left. That's the negative x direction. Below the center line, B points to the right. That's the positive x direction. Right, and this is our center line just for clarity. All right. So. What is B1? Just Let's just remind ourselves what B1 is equal to. It's mu naught Jz. All right. So the magnetic field is going to be constant outside of the slab with the magnitude mu naught Jb over 2. But of course, if we account for direction, that makes the component negative once we're above the center line. All right, so we know that to the left of minus b over 2, so for very negative values of z, we're way below the slab, point to the left, that's a positive component. For values of z greater than b over 2, we are way above the slab, the component is negative because the magnetic field points to the left. And in between the two, we actually have a magnetic field that's directly proportional to z and it's positive below and negative above. Therefore, we end up with a graph that looks like this. 
with zero here. And essentially you have overall the positive component of B as long as you're below the center line, negative component of B as long as you're above the center line. But positive or negative just has a bearing on the direction. Right? It's positive direction or negative direction. In magnitude, of course, you're going to find the same thing above and below. It's symmetric. Thanks for watching this video. At Congress Academy, we create custom study guides so that you don't have to. Send us your syllabus and some old exams, and we'll put together lecture notes, practice problems with step-by-step -step solutions, and classic exam questions so that you don't waste your time. All you have to do is log in and focus on studying what matters most. And if you have questions, we're available to help. If you'd like to learn more about how Congress Academy can help you do well, check us out at congressacademy.com. We look forward to helping you. See you there.